afternoon, guys. Um, hang on one second, sorry. For some reason, my Zoom is not showing. Just a second. Hi, James. How are you, James? Doing good, thanks. Yourself? Good, good, good. Um, what about everyone else? Um, how are you guys? Good, thank you. How are you? How has your week been? Yeah, oh. how are you, ma'am? It's good to see everyone. Um, for some reason, my Zoom got cut off in the middle. Um, hang on. Yeah. Hmm. Must be something wrong with my windows. Okay, um, let me share my screen first and let me see if that problem still exists. Um, Hopefully the problem goes away. Okay. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. yes. Okay, that's good. That's cool. Thanks. So, um, how was the weekend? Do you guys get to enjoy the weekend at all? Yeah. Didn't yeah. do much. Yeah. Went for a walk <laughs> outside, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's all we can do at, at the moment anyway. So, uh, so okay, let me start our second workshop. Now, um, I have made an announcement on LMS um, last week about our classes. So I was told last week that we will be able to open two more tutorials on Wednesday at 10 and at 12 p.m. Um, so the effect of these new tutorials is that um, if you can't um, attend the class from 4 to 5 today, you can attend the class um, at 10 a.m. tomorrow or at 12 p.m. tomorrow, okay? But for those that choose to stay for the entire three hours today from two to five, it does not affect your class, okay? So um, for this week, we'll be talking about two topics, international monetary system and the balance of payments, okay? So these are chapters uh, two and three in your textbook. So the reason why I group these two topics together is because they complement each other. So to understand one, you probably need to understand the other um, as well. So as a result, they will be discussed together today. Okay. So the agenda for today is um, in the first two hours, um, in the first hour, we'll be talking about the theory. So we'll be talking about the main points for international monetary systems and the balance of payments. Okay. In the second hour, we'll go through the tutorial questions for chapter two. And finally, for the uh, tutorial or in the last hour, we'll be talking about chapter three tutorial questions. Okay. Any questions with the structure? Or are we happy to proceed? All good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So in chapter two, um, we talk about international monetary systems, right? So in chapter two, we basically introduce the main um, monetary systems that um, um, that are in the past. Um, and we started from the bimetallism system in 1975, okay? Um, and then we introduced the classical gold standard, the dollar-based gold exchange, and the flexible exchange rate regime, which is what most countries have at the moment, okay? So for each of these um, different exchange systems, I'm not gonna go through the details uh, because that's already in the lecture slides. But for each of these systems, I want you to understand briefly what it is about, so how it works, um, and second, what are the main problems of the systems, okay? 
So, for example, if we go back in time in the 1980, uh, in the 1875, uh, we have the bimetallism system. Okay. So, in this case, this is a double. This is a double standard system in the sense that uh, we have two metals that are used as the mediums of exchange. Okay. So, in this system, uh, both gold and silver at that time were used as money. So you can either exchange goods and services using gold or silver, okay? Um, for international settlement as well, gold and silver are the medium of exchange, okay? So um, the exchange rates under the bimetallism system is determined by the relative value of the money, of the currency, against the gold and silver content, okay? So for example, if, um, say, let's say if I have 10 ounces of gold um, and I have $10, right, for my, um, in my economy, so each of the dollar will be worth one ounce of gold, okay? So if the American um, economy has 20 ounces of gold and there are 10 American dollars around, then each of the dollar will be worth two ounces of gold, okay? So to work out the exchange rate between the Australian dollars and the US dollars, um, we will take the value of the Australian dollar against the gold and we divide it by the, the um, US dollars against the gold, okay? So under this system, um, every Australian dollar is worth um, 50 cents of the USD, okay? Based on the relative gold content of the two economies. Now, the problem with the bimetallism system is that if you fix the exchange rates um, against the gold and the silver content, then there will be a situation where um, when the relative value of the two metals change, so if one metal becomes more, rel uh, becomes more valuable relative to the other one, then eventually um, the um, one of the metals will dominate the system, okay? So the situation happens because, say for example, if gold becomes much more um, valuable relative to silver, then people will choose to keep the gold and they would only exchange silver, okay? So eventually the, um, the metal that is less valuable will be exchanged in the system and everyone will decide to keep the more um, valuable metal, okay? So eventually uh, the bimetallism system um, does not work anymore when one of the metals becomes more um, valuable relative to the other one, okay? So um, back in time in the 1980s, in the 1800s, sorry, um, people discovered gold mines around the world. So in the US, there were new gold mines discovered. So as the gold supply becomes more abundant, the relative value of gold, um, the value of gold relative to silver becomes less, okay? So as the result, people exchange gold in the system and they keep the silver, okay? So eventually, uh, gold was the only metal that was exchanged in the system. Um, and this is when we have the classical gold standard, okay? So, under this, system, um, under this system, gold was the only precious metal used as the medium of exchange between different countries. And once again, the exchange rate is going to be fixed by the relative value of the currency against the gold, okay? Now, the problem here is um, when you fix the currency value against gold, then um, your economic growth is going to be constrained by the relative gold content in your economy, okay? And this is what we refer to as the price specie flow mechanism, which is one of the tutorial questions later on, okay? So um, this is going to be a problem for a country that is trying to grow their economy, okay? So for developing countries, for example, when you try to sell, when you try to export more goods and services um, under the classical gold standard, eventually your economic growth will be constrained 
I'm going to have got something in the chat box. Hang Bu say, not sure for this one. Um, can you explain what you are not sure about, Hank? No, sorry. Uh, actually, I'm talking about French. Okay. I accidentally sent to me. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll explain this later on in the tutorial question. But under the classical gold standard, it's a bit um, restrictive for countries um, as they grow. Okay. So um, as you can see, um, during World War I, this is when countries were trying to finance their weapons for the war. Um, this becomes a lot, a lot more restrictive. Okay. So they be, the classical gold standard becomes um, very much less attractive during the war time. So um, after the classical gold standard, as we mentioned before, because it restricted economic growth, um, people introduced a dollar-based gold exchange standard. Okay. So under this um, exchange regime, the main difference is that instead of packing your currency value against the gold, you introduce another class of reserve, which is the US dollars. Okay. So under this system, the only currency that is packed against the gold is the USD, right? So you pack your USD against the gold at a fixed rate. And the other countries, the other currencies are going to be packed against the USD, okay? So the values of these countries, um, these currencies, or, I'm sorry, are going to be um, determined by their relative value against the USD, okay? Excuse me. Uh, yes. Can I please know what is the meaning of pegged? Um, pack is fixed. So you fix your um, USD against the gold, for example. So you price one um, ounce of gold at 35 USD. Okay. And that will be fixed. All right. Thank you. So the attractiveness of the system is that it allows an additional um, type of reserve. So before, if you want to grow your currency or you want to grow your money supply, you need to grow your gold reserve, okay? Um, under this new system, uh, besides holding gold, you can choose to hold the USD as well. So it gives you an additional flexibility in terms of your money supply, okay? Now, um, even though it's less restrictive than before with the classical gold standard, um, there is an additional problem with this exchange rate regime. Okay. And what is the problem here? So under this um, system, as you can see, for any country besides the US, they can grow their money supply by holding either gold or the USD. Okay. So for the US to be, um, to be the country that provides um, reserves to every other country in the world, the US economy has to be continuously um, in the balance of payment deficit, okay? So we'll talk about this later on, but when, you, um, when other country holds the USD as the reserves, then the account, um, the current account of the US will be in deficit, okay? So as other people buy um, your currency, then your economy would be buying, will be importing more goods and services from overseas, okay? So um, if you have a current and uh, an account deficit for one or two years, that's not a problem. But when you have a continuous deficit for a long time, that will become a problem, okay? So essentially, if you run a balance of payment deficit, that means you keep buying goods and services, okay? So you consume more than you produce, right? So if you imagine if someone um, continued to use their credit card, right? So if you keep consuming using your credit card, eventually at one point in time, um, you will be over borrowing, okay? And this is when you run into problem 
because you can't afford that um, consumption anymore. Okay. So um, under this um, exchange rate regime, it puts a lot of pressure on the U.S. economy to make sure that they um, they will be able to run the account deficit for a long time. Okay. So um, due to the problems with the previous exchange rate regimes, um, later on people decided that they would have a floating exchange rate regime. Okay. So under a floating exchange rate regime, um, you don't have a um, a point of reference to determine your, your your currency value anymore. So gold is no longer an international reserve asset. Um, and with the floating exchange rate regime, it's basically market-based, okay? So your currency value or your exchange rate is going to be determined by the market supply and demand, okay? Now, the problem here with the floating exchange rate regime is that uh, because it's market-based, that means it fluctuates with the market, okay? So the exchange rate is not as... Um, stable as before, right? So, um, for example, if we compare the exchange rates under a dollar-based gold exchange um, with the floating exchange rate regime, under the dollar-based gold exchange standard, your exchange rate is basically fixed, okay? So, for example, the gold value is always $35 per ounce and the other currency values are fixed against the USD. So you basically you basically have an idea of how much your exchange rate is um, against the other currencies. Okay. Under the floating exchange rate regime, it could change every day. Okay. Determining um, is determined by market supply and demand. So um, to sum up. If you think about the different types of exchange rate regimes, and if you think about a central banker's decision to choose um, to follow a certain exchange rate regime. So um, for a central banker, um, there are three main objectives of an exchange rate regime. So number one, um, monetary independence. So this is when you have um, some independence of your monetary policy. The second objective is exchange rate stability. So this is when you want to promote some st stability of your exchange rate so that people are confident when they trade with you. Okay. So when your exchange, when your currency value is quite stable, it's easy for your trade partners to trade with you. Um, the third objective is full financial integration. So this is when you, um, you encourage financial transactions by having people trade your currency, okay? So, the, um, so as we discussed with the previous exchange rate regimes, what we observe is that it's impossible for a central bank to, uh, to achieve all of the three um, objectives at the same time, okay? So for example, if I choose to have a purely floating exchange rate, so this is when I don't intervene at all in the exchange rate market, I let market supply and demand determine my currency value, okay? So in this case, a central bank does not intervene and the market supply and demand will determine the value of the currency. Now, if this is the case, then I achieve monetary independence in the sense that I don't have to um, I don't give up my monetary policy power. Um, in addition, I've got full financial integration, okay? So market participants around the world trade my currency freely. Now, at the same time, I have to give up exchange rate stability, okay? So if I decide to float my currency, my exchange rate is going to fluctuate um, by supply and demand. Um, alternatively, I could choose to fully control my exchange rate, okay? So I choose to fully control the value of my currency. For example, if you think about countries like China um, or Vietnam, so with this country, they tend to have a target 
for the exchange rate. And they will not allow the exchange rate to move outside of the target range, okay? So in this case, if I want to have some sort of control um, over my exchange rate, then um, I achieve exchange rate stability, right? So I have a target rate and my exchange rate only, that, only um, fluctuates within that target range. I have monetary independence in the sense that I don't have to give up my um, policy making power. Um, so I will still determine my, um, my exchange rate regime, okay? But if I choose to have full control of my exchange rate, then I give up um, financial integration, okay? So because the exchange rate is control, um, it discourages market participants to fully participate in trading your currency. Um, alternatively, if I choose to have monetary union, so this is something um, similar to the European Union, okay? So in this case, I choose to be part of a union and I give up my own currency, I will adopt the union's currency, okay? So I think of um, a European Union member, for example. So in this case, um, I don't have any independence in my monetary policy, right? Because I give up my currency. But if I am part of a union, um, I've got exchange rate stability, okay? So if I trade with the union members, I don't have to worry about exchange rate at all. Um, at the same time, I still have full financial integration, okay, with the member countries. So as you can see, um, regardless of um, the exchange rate regime that you choose, um, you will have to give up one or two objectives, okay? So if you want to achieve stability, you've got to give up um, either integration or independence, okay? So um, in chapter two, we also talk about the European Union and their importance. So instead of um, me talking about the European Union, I've got a um, YouTube video here that summarizes the um, main important points of the, oopsie, of the European Union, okay? Let me share you the video. Can you hear the video? I couldn't hear anything. No. Oh, okay. No. Uh, the video isn't playing actually. If you could just play, maybe we can hear it. Uh, yeah, I was playing it before, but I just wanted to know if you can hear it. Um, let me play it again. No, not able to hear. Okay. Um, hmm. Share computer share. Okay. France, the United Kingdom, Italy, Spain, Poland, Romania, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Greece, Belgium, Portugal, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Sweden, Austria, Bulgaria, Denmark, Slovakia, Finland, Ireland, Croatia, Lithuania, Latvia, Slovenia, Estonia, Cyprus, Luxembourg, and Malta. The edges of the EU will probably continue to expand further out as there are other countries in various stages of trying to become a member. How the EU works is hideously complicated and a story for another time, but for this video you need know only three things. First, countries pay membership dues, and second, vote on the laws they all must follow, and third, citizens of member countries are automatically European Union citizens as well. This last means that if you're a citizen of any of these countries, you are free to live and work and retire in any of the others, which is nice, especially if you think your country is is too big or too small or too hot or too cold, the European Union gives you options. By the way, did you notice how all three of these statements have asterisks attached to this unhelpful footnote? Well, get used to it. Europe loves asterisks that add exceptions to complicated agreements. These three, for example, point us towards the first bit of border fuzziness with Norway, Iceland, and Little Liechtenstein, none of which are in the European Union, but if you're an EU citizen, you can live in these countries, and Norwegians, Icelanders, or Liechtensteiners can live in yours. Why? In exchange for freedom of movement of people, they have to pay membership fees to the European Union, even though they aren't a part of it, and thus don't get a say in its 
its laws that they still have to follow. This arrangement is the European Economic Area, and it sounds like a terrible deal were it not for that asterisk which grants EEA, but not EU members, a pass on some areas of law, notably farming and fishing, something a country like, say, Iceland might care quite a lot about running themselves. Between the European Union and the European Economic Area, the continent looks mostly covered, with the notable exception of Switzerland, who remains neutral and fiercely independent, except for her participation in the Schengen Area. If you're from a country that keeps her borders extremely clean and or well patrolled, the Schengen Area is a bit mind-blowing because it's an agreement between countries to take a meh approach to borders. In the Schengen area, international boundaries look like this. No border officers or passport checks of any kind. You can walk from Lisbon to Tallinn without identification or the need to answer the question business or pleasure. For Switzerland, being part of Schengen but not part of the European Union means that non-Swiss can check in any time they like, but they can never stay. This kumbaya approach to borders isn't appreciated by everyone in the EU, most loudly the United Kingdom and Ireland who argue that islands are different, thus to get onto these fair isles you'll need a passport and a good reason. Britannia's reluctance to get fully involved with the EU brings us to the next topic, money. The European Union has its own fancy currency, the euro, used by the majority but not all of the European Union members. This economic union is called the Eurozone, and to join, a country must first reach certain financial goals, and lying about reaching those goals is certainly not something anyone would do. Most of the non-Eurozone members, when they meet the goals, will ditch their local currency in favor of the euro, but three of them, Denmark, Sweden, and of course the United Kingdom, have asterisks attached to the euro section of the treaty, giving them a permanent opt-out. And weirdly, four tiny European countries, Andorra, San Marino, Monaco, and Vatican City, have an asterisk giving them the exact reverse, the right to print and use euros as their money despite not being in the European Union at all. So that's the big picture. There's the EU, which makes all the rules, the Eurozone inside of it with a common currency, the European Economic Area outside of it where people can move freely, and the Selective Schengen for countries that think borders just aren't worth the hassle. As you can see, there's some strange overlap with these borders, but we're not done talking about complications by a long shot, once again, because empire. So Portugal and Spain have islands from their colonial days that they've never parted with. These are the Madeira and Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. Okay, um, I think we should stop there because um, that was the part I wanted to show you. Let me go back to my screen. All right. So um, that was basically a summary of the European Union. So as you can see, it's not as straightforward. Um, it's just a straightforward either yes or no membership, uh, but it's a bit more complex than that. But basically, um, the idea of the European Union is that you want to have some sort of um, um, commonality between the membership countries so that you can trade freely and so that the people can move freely um, between the country, right, between the member countries. So one of the main um, one of the main strong points of the European Union is that they share the same currency, right? Most of the with most of the member um, countries. Now, according to the European Union website, um, with the share the, the the goal of having a shared currency across the member countries is that they can have a single market. Okay, so as you can see, a few. Um, uh, a number of countries in, in, in Europe are quite small. So if they are part of a bigger union, it gives them access to a bigger market, okay? Um, also with the member um, with the member countries, they can um, freely move around the, the other countries and they trade with each other countries easier, okay? So um, with the European Union, um, the main purpose of being in the union is that um, you've got lower transaction costs when you trade with other countries and also you don't have to worry too much about exchange rates, okay, because you use the same um, currency anyway. Now, even though um, it looks like it's a good thing to be a part of the European Union, but as we, as we saw from the Greek um, financial crisis in 2010, there are strings attached to it, right? So there are certain um, rules and regulations that you have to um, to follow to be a part of the union, okay? And um, as we mentioned before, if you are part of the European Union, you've got to give up your own currency, okay? Meaning that if you have a crisis, if you have an economic downturn in your country, um, you can't just bring new money supply to support the uh, economy, okay? You can't just um, freely borrow like um, 
like if you're not part of the member um, of the union. Okay, so um, with the European Union, with the membership, you've got to follow a certain set of rules. And because of these rules, it's a bit more restrictive in terms of which monetary policy you can follow. Okay. All right, so that, that was the main points for chapter two. So overall in chapter two, we talk about different monetary systems from the bimetallism system to the classical gold standard and the dollar bank um, gold exchange standard. Okay, so the common theme of these exchange rate regimes is that um, there is some, um, so the currency value is basically fixed under these regimes. Okay, so it's either fixed against the gold content or it's either fixed against the USD. Okay, so the main problem of fixing the currency value is that um, when market forces move away from the original value, this is when you have a discrepancy between your nominal value, which is the fixed value that you determine at the start, and the actual real value of the currency as perceived by the market participants. Okay, so whenever there is a discrepancy between the nominal value and the real value of a financial asset, this is when people speculate. Okay, so this is this is when markets speculate, and this is when um, there is potential for crisis, okay? So for example, if you look at the Asian um, currency crisis in 1997, um, one of the contributors of the crisis was because the Asian currencies were fixed at that time. So when the Asian um, economies become weaker, their real value, the real currency value is actually lower than the fixed value, okay? And that was when market speculated. Okay. Um, so because of these problems, um, people later on people decided to flow the exchange rate in the sense that you just let the market um, supply and demand determine the exchange rate value. Okay. Um, we also talk about the um, emergence of e the European Union and the introduction of the euro as one of the most important currencies in the world. Um, recently, okay. And finally, um, as we mentioned before, with currency crisis, um, most of the time it happens when you have a fixed value, okay. So when you when you try to fix your currency value, and the real value deviates from that fixed um, exchange rate, okay. So um, there's one more point I want I would like to talk about with the agency. Sorry, with the Asian currency crisis in 1997. So um, number one, the crisis, um, one of the contributors of the crisis was when you fix your currency value. And number two, um, when an exchange rate is fixed, when your currency value is fixed for a long time, it created a impression that exchange rate risk is not an important issue, okay? So for example, back in the 1997, when foreign investors invested in the Asian countries, um, they did not hedge their exchange rate risk. They did not manage their exchange rate risk, okay? Because the exchange rate at that time was fixed. So this is something that you need to also understand. So even though an exchange rate is fixed, it does not mean that um, it will be fixed forever, okay? So for example, um, imagine today if China determines to change the exchange rate um, to a different rate, and if you don't hedge your exchange rate risk, then there could be an um, adverse implication on your portfolio, okay? okay? All right, um, any questions so far with chapter two? If not, let's move on to chapter three, okay? So in chapter three, we talk about the balance of payments. So this is um, basically, this is um, how countries record um, transactions going in and out of the country, okay? So you can think about the balance of payment as a statement of flow, okay? So the, um, 
The purpose of the balance of payment is for countries to record transactions um, going in and out of the country. Okay, so for example, let's take Australia as an example. So with the balance of payments, this is when the Australian um, central bank records imports. So anytime when we buy goods and services from overseas, exports, this is when we sell goods and services to um, our foreign trade partners. Financial asset as well. So uh, we record any financial transactions going in and out of our country, okay? Um, besides these transactions, we also think about, we also record official reserve. So this is when the government um, steps in the foreign exchange market and buy and sell foreign reserves, um, foreign currencies, okay? Okay. So um, if we want to define the balance of payments, it's simply just a statistical record of the transactions uh, between our country and our um, foreign trade partners, okay? So this is um, going to be recorded in the double entry bookkeeping. So anytime when we receive money from foreigners, so when there's a cash inflow in our economy, this is recorded as a credit or a uh, positive cash flow. Anytime when we pay to foreigners, uh, when there's a cash outflow, then this is recorded as a debit, okay? So double entry bookkeeping, every transaction has two entries, okay? Now, this is a, an example that I took from the RBA. So if you go to the RBA, um, if you go to the education section, um, you will see a section for the balance of payments, okay? And this is where I take this example from. So credit, this is when you record any cash inflow. Debit is cash outflow, okay? So the net is just a difference between your credit and debit. So for Australia, um, the three main important um, accounts is the current account, the capital and financial account, and the reserve assets, okay? The balance of payments is simply just the cumulative sum of the three different accounts, okay? Um, now, sometimes we can't reconcile different transactions. So there will be some little discrepancies between different accounts. And so to account for these discrepancies, we have the net errors and omissions, okay? So that is how a balance of payment look like. Now, let's look at a few examples of how um, people record transactions in and out of the country, okay? So once again, I took this example from the RBA. So let us look at the first example. Now, in this case, if I have a company that exports um, a million dollar worth of iron ore to a Chinese steel maker, how would I record this transaction on my balance of payments? Okay, so if I work for the central bank, um, how would I record this transaction? So remember that this is a double entry bookkeeping. So to record this transaction, you need two entries, okay? So let me start a little poll and see um, what it looks like, okay? All right. So here I have an export, okay? So the first, thing that I would do is I would record it under my um, current account, okay, for export and import. So in the poll question that I just launched, um, here you've got four different answers and you can choose multiple answers, okay. So remember that this is a double entry bookkeeping. So you need two transactions, you need two entries for this transaction, okay.
So I've got seven answers. So here I've got a credit and I've got a debit. Okay. And I have two entries, one and two. So if you think about exam or test answer, right? So if you have a multiple choice question, normally um, you would allow about two to two and a half minutes to answer the question, okay? So we are now at the two minutes and 10 seconds. Right. Well done guys. Let me end my poll and share the results for you, okay? Okay, so um, did anyone want to explain to me how to record this transaction in the double entry bookkeeping? So she doesn't have money on the uh, Sai, can you repeat your answer, please? So she recognize money only when it's received. You yeah, should recognize from, money only when? When it's received. The payment is made. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's for simplicity purposes, um, let's assume that you're going to get the payment tomorrow, right? So if that's the case, how do I record this transaction? So... If this is an export, how would I record it under my current account? I think a uh, hundred million shipment of iron ore from Australia has been exported, which is a credit. Exactly right, spot on. Yeah. So this is and, a credit. And okay. the goods receivable after that, like for example, finished goods is a debit. So Australia needs to pay China uh, for the uh, finished goods basically. Uh, now let's just focus on this particular export, right? So what you're talking about is, um, I think, another transaction in it. So, okay. yeah, so you're talking about exporting the iron ore now and then importing like the finished good later on, right? Right. Yeah, so I think that will be a different transaction. Okay. But for just this export, uh, we will have two different entries to record the transaction, okay? Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, yes, did someone say something? You know, only debit the goods which are exported? Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, there's a lot of background noise, I can't hear you too well. So with the export, we're going to record a hundred million in here, right? The second one would be the trade credit. So with the trade credit, um, this is going to be recorded in the financial account, okay? And this is going to be a credit, um, a debit, okay? So how does this happen? So when you export $100 million to your trade partner in China, um, the Chinese trade partner have to pay you, okay? So this $100 million is to recognize a reduction in the foreign holdings of the AUD.
Okay, so with a double entry bookkeeping, you're going to have two different entries for one transaction, one debit and one credit. Okay. So normally with an export, it's a cash inflow. So you would have a, um, a credit in your um, current account. Right. So this is another example also from the RBA. Now, in this example, we have two Australian residents going overseas and as a tourist, they um, spend some money overseas. OK, so let's assume that they spend five million in total in their overseas trip. So the question here is, how do we record this expense um, in our balance of payments? OK, so here we have an Australian citizen going overseas, um, Indonesia, and they spend money there, okay? So once again, I'm gonna have a double entry bookkeeping for this transaction. And let me share the poll, okay. So here, once again, you need to think about two different entries. You need to have one debit and one credit, okay? So if I go overseas to spend money, how is it going to be recorded on my current account? So here I'm talking about consumption, right? So I go overseas and I consume some goods and services overseas. So if it's consumption of goods and services, I know that one entry should be in my current account, okay? share the results with you guys okay all right so the first answer was the five million australian um, the five million dollars that we spend overseas is recorded as the debit okay and we've got 15 people answering um, choosing this answer so this is the correct answer now here i'm talking about spending money overseas okay so as a result, um, from an Australian point of view, I am importing um, goods and services, right? So if I consume goods and services from overseas, this is when I import, okay? So I consume goods and services from a foreign trade partner. Okay. Does that make sense? So if I use goods and services from a foreign country that is um, importing, okay? Um, now, this is the first entry. So here I'm gonna write 5 million um, for debit, okay? Just gonna write minus five to make sure that this is a cash outflow. Um, with the second entry, now, if I choose to, if I pay goods and service, I mean, if I pay for my goods and services, um, I'm going to pay to the foreign um, trade partners, right? So 
in the financial account, I'm going to create another entry for credit for 5 million. So you can think of this as um, when I consume goods and services, um, when I pay to my foreign trade partner, um, I increase the foreign holdings of the AUD. Okay, so the holdings. So it's like when, uh, when they uh, deposit 5 million in their own account, so that, that becomes a credit entry. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So here, because I pay money to my foreign trade partner, um, their holdings of my AUD will be increased by 5 million, right? So does that make sense? If I consume goods and services, this is going to be an import. So as I consume, I need to pay money to my foreign trade partner. So if I pay, I would increase the foreign holding of the AUD. Okay. Does that make sense? So because I buy goods and services from overseas, I pay my foreign trade partners. So let's say, let's assume that they have like a, um, a bank account with an Australian bank, right? So when I pay to them, I increase their bank account balance by $5 million. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, can you please exp can explain me about current account and financial account a little bit? Yeah, so with the current account, this is when I record um, anything to do with goods and services. Okay. So if I buy goods and services from overseas, I will record it under the current account. With the financial accounts, this is when I record financial transactions in and out of the country. So if I invest, for example, if I buy stocks um, or bonds in the US market, that is when I record it under the financial account. Okay. So financial transaction goes to the financial account and uh, goods and services will go to the current account. Oh, okay. even if we buy or sell yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So that's a good point. Um, even if you buy or sell, um, if you talk about goods and services, it always goes to the current account, okay? And financial transactions go to the financial account. Good guys. Um, last example, and then I'll give you a break, okay? So this is the last example that I took from the RBA as well. Um, so here, what I have is a financial transaction, okay? Let me launch another poll. So here, as an Australian citizen, um, Taylor buys $20 million worth of shares in the company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, okay? So in this case, I go and invest overseas, okay? Um, don't worry too much about these points. Let's just think about how to record the transaction first, okay? The shares are paid for uh, using the money from Taylor's bank account in Australia, okay? So once again, I'm gonna think about two entries, a um, credit and a debit. And because I've got a financial transaction, um, this is going to go into my financial account, okay?
next two minutes. So um, most people chose answer A, which is correct. So if you purchase the share, they're going to have to pay. Um, oopsie, sorry. So um, no, um, A is actually not correct. So if you purchase the shares, you're going to have to pay money. So the purchase is going to go into the um, portfolio investment entry in your financial account as a debit, okay, because you pay. So if you have a cash outflow, you're going to record it as a debit, okay. I think there's a typo in that um, poll. Um, the one answer, it says it's as a credit, but I think it should be debit, and that's why a lot of people didn't choose it. Uh, which one is it, James? Uh, the last... The last option. The last option, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, 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 I see. It's a credit, I think it should be debit, and that's why people didn't choose it. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, so that's right. Um, it should be a um, debit minus. Um, yeah, so that's correct. So in this entry, um, for this transaction, you're going to have two entries in your financial account. So the first one is to record the payment that you have to pay for your um, investment. Um, and the second is to record the holdings that you have, right? So here, because I pay, this is a cash outflow for me. So I'm going to record this as a uh, debt. 20 million. At the same time, this is going to be my holding. So this is my financial assets. So I'm going to write down here, I have just created an asset of 20 million um, in the foreign stock. Okay. Okay. So last point for balance of payments. So with the balance of payments, uh, because this is a double bookkeeping entry, um, every time when you record a, when you buy something, right? So if you buy something from overseas, when you import something, um, as you import, you're going to be paying money to the overseas trade partner. And as a result, um, the balance of your current account should always be the opposite of the balance of your financial account, okay? So the current account is um, should always offset the capital or financial account um, by the same amount so that the balance of payment is zero, okay? The idea is that so the value of whatever is traded or whatever is recorded in the current account should always be offset by the money that you either pay or receive for that um, goods and services, okay? Now, um, with this balance of payment identity, um, this is a very simple um, definition of the balance of payment identity. In reality, you've got to take into account two other things, okay? Number one is your official reserve. Okay, so normally, um, even for Australia, I'll show you the example in the next slide. Even for countries where, where they have a, a floating exchange rate regime, um, by definition, they should not have any official reserve, okay, because they let the market supply and demand determine their currency um, value. But in reality, um, sometimes the um, central bank will intervene into the market and when they intervened, they would change the official reserves, okay? Um, number two, in reality, when you record these transactions, sometimes there will be discrepancies. So um, to reconcile these two uh, different accounts, therefore, uh, people introduce an account for statistical discrepancy, okay? Okay, um, but even after taking into account these two different accounts, um, your balance of payment should always be identified, okay? 
So the sum of the balance of payment should always be zero. Okay. All right. So this is an example that I took from the RBA, from the Australian Reserve Bank. Now, as you can see, even for a uh, country with a floating exchange rate regime, sometimes um, the central bank will still have to intervene in the market. Okay, so sometimes they still buy and sell foreign reserves. Okay, so as a result, um, your balance of payments don't just include the current and the financial accounts, but it also includes the um, official reserves and some allowances for errors and omission, which is in the statistical discrepancy, okay? All right. Um, okay, so that was all for the theory part. Uh, we are right at 3 p.m. Um, let's take a short five minutes break, and when we come back, we'll go through chapter two questions, okay? So I'll see you guys in five minutes. In this link, yeah, don't, in the same Zoom meeting, or is it the tutorial and another Zoom link? Um, it's the same link for today. Yeah. Okay, so um, for chapter two, we've got one, two, three, four, five questions. Question two, three, four, eight, and nine. Let's go through these questions together, okay. So with question two, we are looking at the mechanism which restores the balance of payment equili equilibrium when it is disturbed under the gold standard, okay. So um, this mechanism is called the price species flow. Okay, so how does the price specific flow work or how does the um, balance of payments equilibrium restore? How is it restored when um, it is disturbed under the gold standard? Okay, so when we talk about the balance of payments, we're talking about um, normally, um, I don't know why, but when people say the balance of payment equilibrium, they're talking about the current account. Okay, so you're talking about import and export. Okay, so can someone explain to me how, when you have an imbalance in your balance of payment, how is it going to be corrected under the classical gold standard? So let's start with the account deficit, okay? So if I am currently in deficit, how is it going to be restored under the goal um, standard? So here I've got a deficit, which means I import more than I export. So I consume more than I produce, okay? So if this is the case, what would happen, okay? So I want you to think about how an imbalance in your current account can affect your money supply, okay? Under the gold standard. So how are they linked? So here you need to think about how it is linked to your money supply through your gold content and eventually how it is linked to your prices, okay, or price level in your economy. All right, uh, let me erase everything first. Okay. So before we answer the question, oopsie, what happens? Here we go. So before we answer the question, let's think about how 
the currency values or what is the classical gold standard, okay? So as we discussed before with the classical gold standard, your exchange rate is determined by your, um, your currency values or your exchange rate is determined by your gold content, okay? So for example, if an ounce of gold is worth $30 in the US and it is worth six pounds in the UK, then to work out the exchange rate between the pounds and the USD, um, you would take the ratio of 30 um, divided by six, okay? So that means every pound is worth five USD, okay? So this is how you determine your exchange rate under the classical gold standard. Right, so under this standard, under the gold, um, the classical gold standard, um, your account imbalances would be corrected through the um, price PC flow mechanism. Okay, so how does that work? So suppose you have a trade deficit, okay? So suppose at the moment your current account is not in balance. So here you have more import than you have export, okay? So what happens is if you buy too much, if you keep consuming goods and services from overseas, if you keep buying too much, right? That means you're going to be paying money outside, okay? So in this case, because you are a net consumer, you'll be a net payer as well, okay? So if you are a net payer, that means you would have to pay to your um, trade partners overseas, okay? So because you pay more than you receive, there will be an outflow of gold from your economy, okay? So here your gold content would decrease because you have to pay more than you receive. So um, an important point to note here is that your money supply is packed against your gold content, right? Because you fix your currency value against your gold reserve. So because the gold content decreases, what happens to your money supply? Your money supply would also decrease as well. Decrease as well. Thanks, James. So here your money supply will also decrease, okay? Now, from economics, right, from economics 101, we know that when you have a lower level of money supply in the system, the price level in your economy is also lower, okay? So when you have a lower money supply, the price level in your economy is also lower. So what happens when your goods and services uh, have a lower price relative to your trade partners? When your prices is low, the demand for your goods and services will increase. Okay, so it's lower. cheaper, yeah. Exactly, yes. So when your price is cheaper, there will be more demand for your goods and services. Okay. What happens when you have higher demand? You'll get more gold. The supply. Yes. So it will equal out again. Exactly right. right? So um, Because you'll get more exports than imports. Exactly right. So when you have higher demand, that means people will buy more goods and services from you. So because they buy more goods and services, the amount of exports will increase. Okay. So because export in increases, remember that we start with the trade deficit. Okay. So when your export increases, it will reduce the amount of deficit, bringing your trade um, balance back to equilibrium, okay? So here your trade balance will go back to zero. All right, so we have just done um, a trade deficit. We have just look at how a trade deficit is corrected through the price PC flow mechanism. Now, if I have a trade surplus, can someone tell me what will happen 
to my money supply and eventually to my um, balance of payment. Okay. So if I start here with a trade surplus, meaning I have more exports than imports. So I sell more than I buy. Okay. If this is the case, what would happen to my goal content? So if I sell more than I buy, what is going to happen? Uh, did someone say something? Can you talk a bit louder, please? Uh, gold would be info. You will buy more of the gold? Uh, no, you buy goods and services. Okay. So here, you sell more goods and services than you buy. So what would happen to your gold? Your gold would increase, and so your currency would increase, and so people wouldn't buy it because it's more expensive? Exactly right, spot on. So here, because I sell more, people are going to pay me more gold and that will increase my money supply. And as a result, when I have more money supply, the prices will increase, okay? So the, the price level in my economy is going to increase and that would discourage um, demand, right? So there will be less demand for my goods and services. As a result, my export decreases relative to import. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Is it a good thing if demand of the goods and services decreases in the country? Uh, no, it's not a good thing. So if you try to sell, if you're an exporter, it's not a good thing for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So if your business is to export goods and services, you don't really like this. So um, eventually, because our goods and services are too expensive, um, we will have less demand, and therefore our export is going to decrease relative to import. And as export decreases, our balance of payment will go back to equilibrium, which is zero, okay? So this is how um, Whenever you have a trade imbalance um, through the change in the goal content of your economy, it will correct itself. Okay. So when you have a trade imbalance, either trade deficit or trade surplus, it will be corrected through a counter flow in your goal content. Okay. And as a result, your balance of payment will go back to equilibrium, okay? So what is the implication of this mechanism for a country that is trying to grow the exports? Say if you're here, right? So you're not consuming too much. You're trying to sell. You're trying to run a trade surplus. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. So the question is, um, what is the implication of this mechanism for a country that is trying to grow their exports? So suppose I'm a developing country, right? And I'm trying to, I'm trying very hard. I'm trying to work very hard to sell more to my trade partners overseas. To try to grow my economy. They were on to increase their currency value by selling more to other countries to exporting more from exporting more, you know? Yeah, so when you sell more, your currency value is going to increase. Yeah, yeah so yeah. the other country is gonna buy our currency. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But can you can you sustain this situation? Can you be um, an exporter forever? Oh uh, like sometimes you know we need to import as well to maintain a good relation, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Because of demand, uh, we have to import and export both of the things. So most of the countries will import and export at the same time. But what I'm saying is, um, I'm talking about the net export, okay? So if I want to grow, right, if you think about, let's say, an individual, 
if I want to grow my wealth, I need to be a net saver, right? I can't be a net consumer, okay? The same goes for countries, okay? If I want to grow my economy, I need to be an, a net exporter because I need to be producing, okay? If I'm a net importer, that means I'm consuming more than I produce, okay? So the implication of this mechanism is that um, you can't keep growing forever or you can't sustain your, your growth for too long, okay? Because eventually um, when you sell more, when you're a net exporter, eventually your uh, goal content will grow and that will increase the price level of your goods and services, okay? So um, this situation um, restricts the amount of growth that you can experience because eventually your goal content will be corrected, okay? So one way that you can increase your, one way that you can keep exporting is you have to somehow um, depreciate your currency against the goal content, against your goal content, okay? So for example here, when I keep exporting, when my goal content increase, right? Now, even though my money supply increases, but if I can, so if my money supply increases, it will increase the prices for my goods and services, right? Now I can, if I can counter um, this effect by reducing the value of my currency, right? So if the prices of my goods and services become too high, if I can counter that increase by reducing the value of my currency, by depreciating my currency, I can still maintain um, the high level of exports, right? Does that make sense? Say if my prices increases from $5 to $10, but at the same time, if I depreciate my currency by half, so if my currency used to be, let's say two USD, if I can manage to depreciate my currency value to only one USD, then in this case, for a US consumer, um, the prices of my goods and services will still stay the same, right? Because even though the domestic prices in the Australian dollars increases by um, two times, but because the currency value depreciates by two times, it counter um, affect each other, okay? So in this case, one way that I can keep exporting is to depreciate my currency, okay? So I'll go back to my trade partner and say, I don't want to maintain the current exchange rate anymore. I want to change the current um, exchange rate to a lower value, okay? So this is exactly what happened to a lot of countries during the war. Remember that with the classical gold standard, this was introduced um, before the war, right? Before the World War One. So, during the war times, a lot of countries had to grow their exports because they need to find money to finance their war. So what they did was, instead of respecting the same fixed exchange rate that they determined before, they went back and depreciate the currencies, okay, to counter um, the effect of a higher price. So this is the reason why the uh, classical gold standard could not sustain for too long. Okay, so as countries determine to depreciate the currency, the classical gold standard becomes to collapse. Okay. Um, this is one of the reasons also that a lot of exporting countries like China or Japan, they kept their currency um, at a lower than um, fair value for a long time. Okay, so when they depreciate the currency, this is when they um, they keep their prices of their goods and services low so that people buy their goods and services, okay? All right, um, any more questions so far with this question?
If not, let me move on to question three. Okay. So in question three, um, we are looking at a situation where um, we have the goal standard, right? So our currencies are packed against the goal. So currently, um, one pound is fixed to go at six pounds per ounce. So for every ounce of gold, um, it's going to be valued at six pounds in the UK. Okay. Now in France, the franc is currently fixed to go at 12 francs per ounce. So in France, if you have the same amount of gold, which is one ounce, you can trade it for 12 francs. Okay. So based on this information, if we want to work out the current exchange rate between the pounds and the franc, how much is one pound worth in terms of the franc? Two pounds is equal to francs per pound. Sorry. Uh, two francs is equal to per pound. Exactly right. So if I take six, this is the six to 12 ratio, right? So one, um, one pound is therefore worth two franc. Okay. So based on the current relative value of the um, currencies against the gold, I can say that one pound is currently worth two um, francs. Okay. Now, suppose that in the current um, market exchange, in the current foreign exchange rate market, um, one pound is actually traded at 2.2 .2 francs. Okay. So this is the value of the pound um, in terms of the francs as implied by the gold standard. This is what the market is currently traded at, okay? So in the market, if I have one pound, I can actually trade it for 2.2 .2 franc, okay? So the questions here are, number one, um, how would I take advantage of this situation? And number two, what would be the effect of shipping costs on my trading strategy? Okay. So essentially here I've got two different prices for the same asset, which is the pound, right? So if I trade the pound through gold and then I exchange um, it to the franc, then essentially one pound is worth two francs. Alternatively, if I go to the exchange market, if I go to the currency market and trade the pound directly to the franc, then for every pound, I'm going to be trading it with 2.2 .2 franc, okay? So if I am a trader and if I want to make profit out of this situation, what would be my strategy? We can, uh, yeah, sorry. Anish, Anish, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I was like, uh, we can we can purchase uh, gold by six pounds, mm -hmm. and then we can convert the gold to twelve francs. Uh, Oh no, I have, I have some confusion, sorry. I'll That's get back okay. to you on this, yeah. That's okay. So in simple terms, um, if I see these two prices here in the market, where do I want to buy and where do I want to sell? Are you from France or United Kingdom in this case? Um, so, I'm, so let's say I just observed the market, right? I'm not from France, I'm not from the UK but I'm just looking at these two prices of the pounds. You want to buy two francs and then you want to sell it for 2.2 and gain that 0.2. Exactly right, spot on. So in simple terms, I can see that here, I can buy the pounds at a cheaper price. So I pay two francs to get one pound and then I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna sell one pound, that exactly pound, that exactly same pound 
for 2.2 francs, okay? So here I'm going to earn 0.2 franc, okay? So I'm going to earn the spread in between, okay? So for a trader to earn a profit, I want to be buying at a cheaper price. So I'm going to be buying the pound at 2 francs. At the same time, once I get the pal from the first transaction, I'm going to go to the second market and sell the franc, I mean sell the pal at 2.2 franc. Okay. So by doing so, I'm going to earn a spread of 0.2 franc per pal. Okay. So that is going to be my strategy. Okay. So here, just to summarize the information, the market exchange rate at the moment is uh, one pound is, is equal to 2.2 .2 francs. The indirect exchange rate or the exchange rate that we're going to get through the gold exchange is actually one point is uh, one pound is equal to two francs. Okay. So here, what we're going to do is we are going to be selling the pound at this rate, and we are going to be uh, buying the pound at this rate. Okay. So suppose I start with six pounds just for convenience because one ounce of gold is equal to six pounds. So if I have six pounds, I'm going to be selling these pounds to get 13.2 francs, right? So I'm going to go to the market and I'm going to exchange the pounds for the franc at 2.2, .2, okay? So for every pound, I'm going to get 2.2 .2 francs. And if I have six pounds, that means I'm going to have 13.2 .2 francs. From this transaction. Um, second, I want to be um, exchanging, I'm going to be buying the pounds at two francs through the gold exchange. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to exchange the francs that I observed that I obtained from the first step into gold. Okay. So here I'm exchanging the francs from the first step into gold. So for every ounce of gold, I need to pay 12 francs. So if I have 13.2 francs, the amount of gold I'm going to get is 1.1 ounce. Okay. What do I do next? So once I get that 1.1 ounce in the second step, I'm going to exchange it back into the pounds, okay? So if I exchange 1.1 ounce into pounds, I'm going to get 6.6 .6 pounds, is it? Because for every ounce, I'm going to exchange it for six pounds, okay? So 1.1 times six is 6.6 .6, um, pounds. So if I compare, the profits, um, if I compare the proceeds that I get from step three and the initial amount that I start with, I can see that through these transactions, I have earned a profit of 0.6 pounds, okay? So um, if you look at these transactions, you will see that this is my sale transaction, right? So this is when I sell the pounds at 2.2 .2 francs in the exchange market. With the second two transactions, these are my indirect um, buy transaction, okay? So I want to buy, remember I want to buy one pound for two francs, okay, from the previous slide. So through this transaction, I have earned um, 0.6 pound in profit, okay? If you want to compute the dollar, I mean the um, percentage rate of return, this is a very profitable um, strategy. 
I start with six belts and I profit 0.6. Okay, so that means I earn a 10% profit. Right. And where does this 10% come from? It comes from the mispricing between the two markets. Okay, so as you can see, if I take 0.2 divided by 2, that will be 10%. Okay. So the second question is what is the effect of shipping costs on my strategy? Okay. So obviously, as you can see from these um, transactions, there are a few steps. Okay. So first, I've got to go to the exchange market sell the pounds to get the francs, and then I'll go to francs, exchange it for gold, and then I'll go to England and exchange gold for pounds, okay? So there is significant shipping costs um, for this strategy. So the effect of shipping costs would be, obviously, if the shipping costs are higher than my profit, then it doesn't, it's not worth it for me to exercise this strategy, right? So when the shipping cost is higher than 10%, then maybe it's not worth it for me to do this um, arbitrage profit, arbitrage strategy, all right? Any questions so far? So you will see later on in this subject that you will um, have to come back to this arbitrage um, type of strategy quite often. So let me just write it here. So this is an example of an arbitrage strategy. Okay. So when we talk about arbitrage strategies, we're talking about um, a trading strategy that exploits any mispricing opportunity in the market. Okay. So when you have the same identical asset that is traded at two different prices in two different markets, this is when you have a mispricing opportunity. Okay. All right. Um, question four, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the gold standard. Now, we have talked about this um, gold standard before. So did someone want to tell me what are the advantages and disadvantages of this strategy? I mean, this exchange rate regime. Okay. Did someone want to um, discuss the advantages of the gold standard? Um, yeah, I had it written down. <clears throat> uh, it was it was a it was a hedge against price inflation. Um, how is that so? Uh, because it was based off the gold, so. Uh, yeah, hmm. that's um. Yeah, so if you relate it back to the price PC flow, then yeah, so it's one of the. That's, that's one of the good points. So because of the price PC flow, whenever you have an increase in prices, it will be corrected through a counter flow of gold. Okay. So yeah, so the prices in your economy will not go too high. Anything else? So. Uh, also, I'd say because it's gold, you couldn't just... Unlike paper money, where you can just print, 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 gold, it's harder to come by. So you can't just increase the gold, uh, a country's uh, gold um, easily, um, unlike they can do with money these days. Yeah, so, um, well, even these days, um, uh, in theory, the government can print money as much as they want. But I think in practice, um, to avoid hyperinflation, they don't normally do that. So like with the Australian government, for example, when they introduced the stimulus packages, um, the job seeker scheme, normally they go to the international bond market and issue bonds to raise funds. Yeah, so 
it's easier to raise money these days, uh, but it's not as easy as printing money. So you've got yeah. to issue new government bonds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree. So when you pack the value of your currency against gold, then it's not too easy to grow your money supply. You've got to find new goal. You've got to find new goal content. Um, so I think that's the first one. Yep. So um, you don't really have very high inflation because every time when the prices increase too much, it will be counter by a um, counter flow of gold. Um, and so your money supply will go down again. Okay. Anything else? So with the gold standard, um, as we mentioned before, whenever you have a trade imbalance, it will be automatically corrected through the counterflow in gold. And so you don't have to worry too much about the balance of payments, okay? Because it will be corrected eventually. What about the disadvantages, right? So what are the bad things with the gold standard? Uh, I have written down, it was um, countries didn't really have to follow it uh, if they didn't want to. It was exactly. harder to like, regulate, I guess you could say. Exactly, so, right, uh, exactly. Yeah, a bit harder. Um, also, I have written down it lacks sufficient monetary reserves. So they could face, uh, the world economy could face pressure from that, I guess. Exactly right. So it's a good point. So um, with the gold standard, um, you have to fix your currencies against your gold content, right? And you have to maintain that um, fixed level. So in the example before, if one pound is equal to two francs, you're going to have to maintain that exchange rate That's to, for the gold standard to sustain. Um, but as you see from uh, previous um, incidents, a lot of countries, when they went into difficulty, they will start to depreciate their currencies. Okay, so this is when the gold standard collapsed because the member countries did not um, respect the rules. Okay, um, and second, also, as you mentioned, James, the um, gold supply could be quite restricted. Okay. So if you want to grow your money supply, it's going to be quite hard. Okay, so that was question four. Um, question eight, explain the arrangement and workings of the European monetary system. Um, this is a pure theory question. Um, so basically with the European monetary system, um, this is a system uh, before the uh, European, the, the Euro currency, right? So this was established in the 1970s, I think 1979. Um, so the purpose of this European monetary system is that it is to establish a zone of monetary stability in the Europe. Um, to coordinate exchange rate policies against the other currencies. And finally, to prepare for the eventual European Monetary Union. Okay, so this is before the EU and the Euro. So in this system, um, they implemented something similar to the Euro, but not exactly the same, which is called a European Currency Unit. So this European currency unit is a weighted average basket of currencies for the member countries. So it's, um, it's not one currency, it's a basket of currencies, right? And it's weighted by the um, size of the economy for the member country. So um, this 
European currency unit is maintained through the exchange rate mechanism, which is a set of rules that um, ensure that that is there to ensure the European currency unit is in place for member countries. Okay. So every time when the currency, when a country's European currency unit deviates from a certain agreed level, then the member country has to make sure that it goes back to par values. Okay. So once again, there's a element of fixing in here in the sense that you have to make sure your currency is fixed against the European um, currency unit. Okay. So eventually the European currency unit um, evolves into the euro okay so instead of having a basket of weighted average currencies um, they just decide to have one currency for all member countries okay which eliminates a lot of um, um, inconvenience and a lot of uncertainty in terms of exchange rates so this was before the euro um, in 1999, I think. Okay. Um, final question for chapter two. So in question nine, uh, we are talking about, we are comparing the uh, floating exchange rate and the fixed exchange rate, okay? So there are arguments for and against the alternative exchange rate regimes. In particular, we're talking about the uh, flexible versus the fixed exchange rate regimes. Okay. So question A, list the advantages of the uh, flexible exchange rate regime. So what do we think? Um, why should countries follow a fix? Sorry, why would country follow a flexible exchange rate regime? So when we say flexible, it's similar to a floating exchange rate regime. Okay, so we leave the market demand and supply to determine currency values. Uh, it lets countries do their own um, policies, I guess. They don't have to follow a certain standard. Exactly. So if a country have a uh, fixed exchange rate regime, that means your monetary policy has to dedicate to maintain a fixed exchange rate, right? What I mean is you have to spend resources to buy foreign reserve, for example, um, if you want to um, depreciate your currency value or you have to sell your foreign reserves if you want to appreciate your currency value, okay? So with a flexible exchange rate regime, you don't have to worry about that. You can use your money, you can use your resources for other things like um, to reduce unemployment or to, uh, to control the, the um, inflation rate in your economy, okay? Anything else? Oops, okay. Anything else? What about the others? We are very quiet today, are we? James, do you want to say something? Oh, look, I have, uh, it's easier to, for external um, adjustments with other countries and to do, because it's flexible, it's easier to adjust things if necessary. Yeah, yeah, so that's right. So with a flexible exchange rate, um, the market adjusts itself. So whenever you have more demand and your currency appreciates, so on and so forth. Um, with a fixed exchange rate regime, on the other hand, every time when the exchange rate value depreciates, um, deviates a lot from the original value, it requires the central bank to step in to change the value of the exchange rate. Okay, so that's a bit more, uh, it's a bit harder for the central bank. I think it also depends upon the exports, if people, uh, if people use more. So yeah, yeah. 
yeah, we export more, and uh, in, in in that case, you know, maybe we'll have more demand. Like, uh, like we can we can show more demand. And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So every time when you export and import more, then your exchange rate will be automatically adjusted by supply and demand in the market. Yeah. Rather than relying on the central bank to adjust. Yes. All right. So this is one of the main um, um, issues with the Asian currency crisis in 1997, right? So what happened was in 1997, when the exchange rate, when the fair value of the exchange rate um, deviates from the original value, um, remember that because these cur these Asian um, economies had a fixed exchange rate regime back then, um, when the exchange rate started to deviate from the original value, um, the fixed exchange rate allowed that deviation to accumulate for a long time, right? So as it accumulates for a long time, eventually when the central banks had to adjust, it was a big jump from the original value. Okay, and that causes the market to further panic. Okay, so instead of allowing for smaller jumps, um, there was a big jump like that. Okay, so whenever there is a big jump, the market tends to overreact. Okay, all right. Um, so the second point, maintenance of national policy autonomy, this is what we mentioned before, okay? So instead of using your resource trying to stabilize your exchange rate, you can use it to um, stabilize your employment, for example, or to control your inflation rate, okay? Okay. Um, question B, criticize the flexible exchange rate regime from the viewpoint of the proponents of the fixed exchange rate regime, okay? So what are the arguments against a flexible exchange rate? Um, so most of the time people criticize the flexible exchange rate regime for the fact that um, it tends to fluctuate a lot, right? So when you allow market um, to determine the exchange rates, as you can see, if you look at the Australian dollars for or the US dollars, um, you will see there's a lot of fluctuation, okay? So, so some people argue that a very volatile exchange rate is a bad thing for trades because it creates uncertainty for your trade partners, right? So if I trade with, um, say, the US, um, if I sell something to the US and I get paid in the USD in two months time, and in two months time, if the USD depreciates a lot, then I will get less money than before, okay? So that's not a good thing for me. So therefore, if people are worried about this uncertainty, then they might not want to trade overseas, okay? And that leads to a suboptimal allocation of resources, okay? So volatility sometimes is not a good thing. Now, what is the argument, uh, what is the counter argument to that? So you can say that uncertainty is not a good thing, right? So volatility is not a good thing. And normally people require premium to trade something that is very volatile, okay? But um, for a trade partner, from an international trade's point of view, uh, this is not necessarily a very big issue because I can hedge my exchange rate risk, right? If I worry too much about the future value of the USD, I can buy a forward contract today to lock in an exchange rate, okay? So that's not really a big issue for me. Okay. And what, what in case if uh, US dollar increases in the future? What happens if the USD appreciates yeah. in the future? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's good for us, right? Yeah, it's good for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, so if you expect to receive the USD in the future and if it appreciates, it's a good thing for you. Yes, exactly. And the UN, I think, uh, you know, being fixed isn't good for a long time. Uh, why is that? You know, it should be flexible, like, uh, yeah, at, at some point of time, it should be like increasing and decreasing. So uh, it can't be even fixed for the long time, right? At, at the same at the same ratio. So it should be having some changes. Yeah, so most naturally, I think in financial markets, um, nothing fixes for a long time. Um, yeah. yeah, so financial markets tend to move quite a lot. Uh, um, hopefully towards positive. <laughs> Um, you will never know. I mean, it's very hard to forecast the future. Um, so, but if you worry too much about exchange rate volatility, you can always hedge it, right? You can manage it somehow. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. So, um, part C, let's move on to question C and then we can take a short break. Okay. Um, question C, rebut the above criticism from the viewpoint of the provenance of the flexible exchange rate regime. So if you are a uh, supporter of the flexible exchange rate regime, how do you argue against the previous argument? Okay. And what was our previous argument? Uh, it was the volatility. Would... Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So here it says that if you let your currency value um, fluctuate too much, then it discourages trade. Okay. Yeah. So how do you argue against it? Uh, what does suboptimal allocation of resources mean? So that means it's um, suboptimal means it's less than desirable. Right, so optimal is the best scenario and suboptimal is less than the best. So does it mean that the uh, resources allocated are not up to the mark? Yeah, so what it means is um, when it's volatile, people don't trade too much and therefore it leads to a suboptimal level of trade. In this context. So trade um, less than because of the uncertainty, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're worried about this risk, then you don't trade that much. You prefer to trade with your domestic trade partners. Yeah, yeah. So for this one, they would rebut and say that uh, if it's fixed, the government can't um, use them uh, for other resources in the economy, I guess you could say. Like they, they have to um, maintain this fixed number and they can't lower or higher it to maybe focus um, parts of it somewhere else? Yeah, that's a good point. So here the government has to spend resources trying to fix the exchange rate, right? And they can't do something else, something better. Anything else? Any other people? So here, um, the counter argument is um, firstly, as I mentioned before, if you worry too much about exchange rate risk, you can choose to manage it, right? Using either a forward contract or something else, right? So to say that um, the exchange rate volatility discourages trade is not very correct because if your trade partners are worried about exchange rate risk, they can always hatch it, okay? They can always eliminate it by using a forward contract, okay? 
Um, and second, as you mentioned, Jinx. So under a fixed exchange rate regime, when you choose to fix your exchange rate, you normally have to spend your resources trying to stabilize your exchange rate, right? And most of the time, that includes trying to restrict international uh, flows, right? So one way to fix your exchange rate is to stop people from um, moving capital in and out of your country, okay? And that goes against international trade, okay? So it's a self-defeating measure. So by trying to stabilize your exchange rate, um, you might accidentally discourage people from trading at the, at the first place, okay? So it's a counterproductive measure. All right, so I hope that by the end of this chapter, you would understand the different, um, firstly, the different exchange rate regimes that have existed in the past. And number two, um, the, the uh, different advantages and disadvantages of different types of exchange rate regimes, right? So there's no best exchange rate regime. You just have to be aware of the um, issues of the exchange rate regime that a country adopts, okay? So for example, in Australia, um, with the balance of payment example that I showed you before from the RBA, you can see that there's not much um, official reserve happening, okay? The official reserve account is basically zero, and that is because they have a floating exchange rate, okay, where they don't intervene in the market. So um, the implications of that is that um, they've got more flexibility in terms of their monetary um, policies, right? So if they want to target a lower inflation rate, they can use the resources to do that because they are not tied to their exchange rate policy. Okay, but on the other hand, the exchange rate is volatile. Okay. All right, so that is it for chapter two. Any questions with chapter two? Any more questions with chapter two? If not, let's take a five minute break and we'll come back at 10 past. Okay, so I'll see you guys back at 10 past for chapter three questions. Okay. Okay, guys, um, let's move on to chapter three. So these are the questions for chapter three. Um, questions one, three, four, five, so on and so forth. So um, we have gone through question one before um, in a previous examples at the start of the class. Um, I think question three and four are quite important. Also question five. Um, these questions, um, if we don't have time, we can skip those. And question 10 is quite important. Also problem one, which is to illustrate how the numbers how to read the numbers in the uh, balance of payments, okay? So let's go through these questions. Okay, so question three, um, the United States have experienced continuous current account deficit since the early 1980s, okay? Um, what that means is, sorry, here we go. So from the 1980s, um, if we look at the capital account and the current account in the US, um, if we plot them on the graph, this is what it looks like, okay? So um, consistently, we see that the current account in the US has been in deficit for as long as um, 30 years back, okay? 40 years now. Um, in contrast, the capital account has been in surplus, okay? And this reflects the, um, normal, the, the normal relationship between a capital account and a current account, okay? So when you have a current account deficit, that means you import more than you export, okay? So here you import 
more than you export. So in other words, you are the net consumer of the world or you're the net buyer of goods and services. Oopsie. Okay. So because you keep buying goods and services from outside, you have to pay for it somehow, right? So as you pay, you increase the foreign holdings of your own currency, okay? So here is the foreign holdings of your own currency. Or US assets, okay? So as a result, when you have an account deficit, it's normally um, coincided with an a, with a capital account surplus, okay? So what do you think? So why would the US experience a consistent current account deficit over the past few decades? What are the main causes? And what do you think would be the consequences of this account deficit? I think they don't plan to produce more, man. Yeah, so they, they don't produce more. They actually consume more, yes. So what are the causes? So number one, yeah, they consume too much. They basically, so if you look at the consumption data for the US, um, it's quite high, okay? And if you also look at the um, credit card or uh, personal debt in the US, it's also alarmingly high, okay? So number one, they tend to consume too much. What else is there? What do you think are possible explanations of their account deficits? So one, too much consumption. They invest a lot of money um, in developing their country uh, not seeing how they are saving uh, uh, so they don't save too much yeah, yeah they, they take uh, debts from uh, for example they, they used to take a lot of debt from China to yeah them. yeah they, they tend to borrow yeah so yeah. that's a high proportion of borrowing especially from China um, yeah, so you can say there's a lot of financial investment. There's a lot of interest in investing in the US, right? So foreign investment tends to be quite high. Mm, what else is there? Let's see what is there. So um, reason number one, as um, Rohit said before, um, there is a strong demand for the USD, okay? So foreign, number one, foreign investors um, invested a lot in the USD, in the US, sorry. Um, number two, which is related to how the USD was used as a foreign reserve, right? In the um, gold exchange standard, in the dollar-based gold exchange standard. Now, remember what we said before with the dollar-based gold exchange standard? So besides gold, um, other countries can hold the USD as a foreign reserve as well, right? So as a result, um, there is a strong demand for USD from central banks around the world um, so that they can hold as a foreign reserve, okay? So as other central banks, as foreigners um, demand holding USD, what happens is it creates a financial inflow, okay? So foreign investment in the US increases. Um, second, um, there is a strong um, demand for foreign investment um, of foreign investment in the US as well, okay? So if you think about, for example, um, countries that used to be developing countries, right, like Japan or China. So 
as they um, as their economy grew, as they accumulated more wealth, um, a lot of these countries started to invest. They had to find a way to invest their money, right? So one of the popular venue for investment was in the U.S. economy. Okay, so as these foreign countries invested more in the U.S., it created strong demand for the USD as well. So as you have a strong demand for 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 financial investment. Um, you have a higher level of capital inflow into the USD, uh, into the US, sorry, into the US economy. So the strong demand for the USD therefore increases the capital inflow in the US, and that explains the capital account surplus, right, over the last few decades. Um, in addition to that, there is an interesting development as well in the international trade landscape. So when you think about countries that used to be um, developing countries like China or Japan, uh, I'm sorry, I picked these countries a lot. So as these countries um, try to export more, they tend to undervalue their currency, right? which is what we talked about before. So when you undervalue your currency, you make your goods and services more competitive by lowering the price of these goods and services, okay? So because the trade partners of the US, including China or Japan, they undervalue the currencies against the USD, what happens is that it makes their goods and services cheaper relative to US goods and services, okay? So the implication of this is, therefore, it increases the amount of imports for the US, right? Because these foreign goods becomes cheaper. And at the same time, it makes it harder for US companies to export to these countries. So as U.S. imports increase and U.S. exports decrease, it creates a trade deficit, okay, in the U.S. Does that make sense? Right. Uh, number three, there is a high level of consumption and low level of savings in the U.S., which means that U.S. citizens like to consume, right, so they like to buy. So as they like to buy, it creates more opportunities for foreign trade partners to import into the US, okay? Um, and finally, um, if you look at the um, level of competitiveness of US industries, um, in the past few decades, there have been um, a lot of mergers and acquisitions, right? So the effect of this is that it decreases the level of competitiveness of the US industry. And so it makes foreign goods more attractive, okay? So these are the main factors that explain why um, the US account deficit has uh, been quite persistent in the past few decades, okay? Excuse me. Huh? Yes. Uh, as if we see there's a lot of uh, import rather than export in the US and there's a trade deficit Consider mm -hmm. then. So, how come U.S. currency is so powerful in the market? Uh, good question. So, I think most of it is because number one, the size of the U.S. economy is quite large, right? So, it's the largest economy in the world. And second, there is a strong confidence, investor confidence in the U.S. economy. Okay. So, when investors are confident, um, they tend to overvalue an asset. Okay. So you say uh, U.S. import goods from other countries, uh, like maybe uh, for cheap and sell it in the U.S. for a more price and make more revenue? Um, sorry, can you rephrase? So uh, I, ju I just want to say if uh, like U.S. Uh, maybe import, you know, some of the products from India and China for cheaper and, uh, you know, sell, sell the same products in their home country uh, for more price. So is that the reason their currency is high? I mean, mm. you know, the uh, the reason uh, like of their economy increasing. 
making more money? Well, I think um, so. Yes, yeah, so that's so. I think that is what makes corporations very profitable. So they, you know, they produce something in a cheap market and they sell it more expensive in another market. But I think it's not just a U.S. thing, right? Um, so that that is a strategy that a lot of corporations adopt, not just U.S. corporations. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So, um, while the U.S. economy is very strong, um, their financial sector is very strong. So, if you think about financial markets, if you compare the Australian financial markets and the U.S. financial markets, you can see why there is a lot of interest in investing in the U.S., right? Because the, the size of the market is quite large, okay? Um, yeah, but I guess most of it is about investor confidence. Would you say that uh, <clears throat> it's the confidence is slowly going down and uh, the euro might take its place? Um, is that the trend that's happening at the moment or is the confidence still pretty high? Uh, that's an interesting question, James. And um, if I know the definite answer to it, I'll be very rich by now. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, so personally, I think, um, especially after the COVID crisis, it shows a lot of um, issues with the US economy and the US um, society overall. So I think yep. after this, um, the investor confidence will not be as good as before. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So um, so the the root. I think the root of the investor confidence in the American economy was pretty much from the war time, from the World War One and World War Two, because what happened was, unlike other countries, America was not too affected by the wars. So they had their time to build up their economies. So from then on, um, they have been. Um, developing their economy much, much more, much, much better than other countries. Yeah, but over time, especially these days, um, if you look at the well, the income inequality in America is quite large. And that says um, something about their society, right? So if that causes um, unrest and if it causes um, anxiety in the society, then you might expect the confidence to go down in the future. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, James, for the question. That's an interesting question. Um, is this actually the second part of the question, right? So what would be the consequences of continuous um, current account deficits? Okay. So in a way that is related to what we discussed before. So how is this continuous current account deficit affect investor confidence in the US economy, right? And could that sustain in the future? Okay. So if you think about a person, for example, that over consumes, so if you have a friend or a relative that over consumes, this person is likely to buy goods and services from their credit card and they tend to buy more than what they earn, right? So eventually you would expect that um, they will run into some financial difficulty because this is something unsustainable. So if we apply the same logic to an economy, uh, you can say that if some, if someone is a net buyer for a long time, if someone is a net consumer for a long time, um, eventually there would be some bad thing that will happen. Okay. Now the key question here, which is something that is very hard to answer, is um, for how long does this last? Okay. So how long do you think the US economy can sustain this account deficit? Okay. Any ideas? 
I was just going to ask, has it in the past, has there been a similar a scenario that we could compare it to or is this still relatively new? Uh, good question. I don't think in the past. Um, the euro? The euro, um, yeah, I need to check their balance of payments data. But I don't think they have run a very persistent trade. Not persistent very, but uh, a slight variation has been done because the euro was uh, united before, but not now. Um, yeah, so in the past, um, countries will run deficits from time to time. Um, but a persistent account deficit is something that is quite rare. Yeah, so you're talking about a persistence. Um, in the account deficit. Okay. Maybe US um, is not just depending on uh, like uh, not the economically sustained countries. Uh, US can bring economy from any part of any country because um, uh, US is, is just like uh, the most powerful and also developing country and if it lose one yeah, i think it, it takes two uh yeah so i think that explains why investors are very confident in the u.s economy um but based on the data it's yeah so what happened was um when you have a very high level of debt in the economy that is a very big side of a financial crisis happening, okay? So for example, if you look at the uh, individual debt level in the US before the 2007 financial crisis, um, you can see that there was a, a, the upward sloping trend, right? So yeah, so the answer in for this question is, um, I am very concerned, right? So if you run an account deficit for a long time, um, that is a concerning thing. But definitely some of the other point it has to fall. Um, sorry, Rohit, definitely. Some, some of the other time it has to, it has to fall the economy. Like if it grows continuously and at a stretch, it goes because investors, uh, you know, trust, like trust is something which is just an, people it can change so if um, it is like uh, us might get back to the crisis the economic crisis at that point of time uh, maybe the, they want some different strategy for that but it will fall definitely someday like yeah mm. yeah i agree so um us has a big gold mines now yeah they, they, yeah, they can produce more yeah. gold. You know? Yeah, they've got um, natural resources, gold and yes. oil, and as well gas. as the, uh, like the, the lot of big corporations. We can, you know, we know yeah. feminine business, this Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and all. So yeah, definitely. Mm. It's really hard to beat US. Anyway, so. Um, it's an interesting case um, to the opposite. Um, so another case that is opposite to what we observed before is um, Japan, right? So unlike the US where um, it runs in the cow deficit in the past few decades, in Japan, they have experienced an cow surplus, right? That is also quite persistent. So if we look at the same time period from the 1980s to the 2010s for Japan, we will see that their current account has been in surplus, meaning they are a net seller, okay? Or they are a net exporter of the world. So they produce more than they consume, okay? At the same time, if we look at their capital account, we will see that overall um, the capital account is in deficit, okay? So what does that mean? 
That means Japan has been producing goods and services to sell to the world. And at the same time, they have invested more in foreign assets relative to foreign investors investing in Japan. Okay. So why is that the case? Why are they investing uh, overseas instead of domestic? Or, or why uh, is the case? So why do they have a current account surplus and why do they have a capital account deficit? All right. So unlike the US, right, Japan was very much affected by the war because uh, what well, they got bombed and stuff. Um, so after the war, they had to reconstruct the economy, right? So as a result, they were trying to be the net exporter of the world. Okay, so as they export more, they will get more money. So as part of that strategy to reconstruct the economy, um, they, Japan has been pursuing a uh, relatively weak yen value, okay? So they try to target um, a soft yen currency relative to the US because they want to sell to the US, okay? So when you have a weak currency, that means it's cheaper to buy your goods and services, okay? As a result, you can export more relative to your import, okay? Now, to support, um, to maintain a weak or a soft yen currency, um, you've got to make sure that you invest overseas, okay? So if you have, if you invest overseas, um, you create demand for the foreign currencies of your trade partners. And as a result, it will make your currency a little bit weaker relative to your trade partner. Does that make sense? So in Can you Japanese, explain that one more time, please? Sure. So for example, if I go and invest in the USD, right? So I create a demand for the USD. So as the USD value appreciates because of higher demand, my yen value will actually be cheaper relative to the USD. Okay. Right, okay. So the exchange rate um, becomes the USD and the yen will go into, um, will be cheaper for the yen. Okay. Yeah, and, and they want the yen cheaper so people will buy their stuff so they can export more. Is that exactly. correct? Is that yeah. the circle? Right. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, so you want your currency to be weak if you want to sell more goods and services. Okay. Um, in addition to that, um, if you look at the consumption behavior of Japanese, um, if you go to Japan, you will find that there, um, you will see a lot of goods and services provided by Japanese companies, right? You don't see a lot of foreign goods and services. So because of that, um, Japanese don't really consume much of foreign goods. And as a result, um, their import is not too much, okay? So these are the factors that explain why um, Japan has experienced a um, net um, current account surplus, right? So they export more than they import. And to support their account surplus, they need to go out and invest more in foreign assets, okay? So Japan is one of the biggest investors in the Asian, in the other Asian countries, okay? So if you think about FDI, which is um, foreign direct investment, in Vietnam, Japan um, is the biggest investor, okay? Now, second question, um, do you think it is desirable to have a continuous current account surplus? Yeah. 
it depends on the demand what the market need i mean what the market expect so we need to produce as much as the demand uh not more yeah. than that but if i really want to sell more right if i really really want to grow my economy and i really want to keep selling to the world yeah but I... it's like uh you know even like if if we produce more a lot we we end up uh, wasting the resources like yeah. even if there's no demand i mean much demand in the market but till we are grow like making you know manufacturing so it doesn't make any sense yeah you touch a very interesting point um so that relates to resources and um environment right so when you produce more you actually um hurt the environment a bit more um so it, it should go according to the demand like how the market uh, it depends on the market how much they need so depends upon it good point um anyone else any other ideas So one of the things about um about this is that um if you let the market to adjust itself right so if you if you're a net exporter for a while you will find that your goods and services become more expensive as your money supply grows right which is what we look at before so eventually it has to correct itself somehow um in which your balance of payment will go back to equilibrium so to maintain a persistent um level of a gas surplus you need to have some sort of manipulation okay so it's not something natural that you it will happen by itself okay so how do you um manufacture a persistent gas surplus normally you would have to depreciate your currency right so to depreciate your currency you need to make sure that you invest in foreign assets to make the other currencies more expensive than you it's a very expensive strategy to do right because you have to invest overseas you have to have the resources to invest overseas okay so this is an expensive strategy to do okay and the net um if you think about the net benefit um it is quite questionable because even though you export more but the prices of your um the prices that you get is actually not very high right you have to depreciate your currency and as a result the financial gains that you get um is actually not that much okay so uh, uh excuse me uh that, if yeah. if if we are depreciating the value of our currency uh does it make an impact on the standard of living of people in that nation mm. well good question i don't really know the answer to that but as far as we can see if you think about countries like china or japan who follow this strategy um i don't think it's the case empirically right so with these countries they actually experience a higher standard of living because of the higher economic growth. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yeah. Or maybe in some other countries um yeah, so I'm not quite sure about this question, sorry. But as far as I can see, it looks like these countries are still doing quite well. Yeah, it seems to be yes. So. Yeah. Right so overall um it might not be desirable because it's a very expensive strategy to follow and the benefits the monetary benefit of it is um uh, not very clear right it's not a clear cut issue All right question 5 Yeah I think question 5 is quite important So question 5 comment on the following statement since the United States imports more than it exports it is necessary for the United States to import capital from foreign countries to finance its current account deficit um comment on this statement 
Okay. Now, um, so this is a bit about the exam, right? So in the exam or a test environment, um, you would expect if the question is theory, you would expect some sort of uh, discussion question like this, okay? So you're not gonna be asked to define something. You're gonna be asked to comment or discuss a certain issue, okay? So let's use this question to practice how we answer the question in the exam, okay? So how do we understand this question? What is the, uh, sorry, the statement. So what is the statement say? Any it shows that the uh, United States uh, only has a trade deficit. Uh -huh. And so that's the first part of the statement. So I think um, importing capital from foreign countries can balance its deficits. Exactly right. So, um, Sujana, so this is um, sim so this is in the spirit of the statement, right? So what the statement is saying is that the U.S. has been imported, uh, importing more than it's exporting. And therefore, to solve the problem or to sustain this level of import, it needs to further import capital from foreign countries. Okay. So to solve the problem of importing more than exporting, you need to import capital. Okay. Do you agree or disagree with the statement? I, I agree on it. So you're saying that you should be importing more capital to fix this um, account imbalance, right? Any other ideas? But in case the uh, United States is import, uh, importing more than exporting, right? So for sure, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's, it's letting its financials go out from the country. I mean, it's, uh, you know, mostly exporting the capital. Yeah, so you're saying that it's already exporting, importing exactly. a lot of capital. Okay. Exactly. It's, you know, uh, I, I don't agree with the second point. It means to be that it, it may export more capital, you know, to, to purchase more. Yeah. So you disagree because um, this is already happening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? I kind of agree with Vivek in this point. So here we are assuming that um, this import um, of goods and services, so the account um, deficit in the US is something independent of the capital account, right? It's basically what we're assuming. So we're saying that to fix this account deficit problem, let's bring in more capital from overseas, okay? So um, there's no right or wrong in this um, answer. So you can express your um, opinion as long as you can back it up. So um, I think the answer here depends on what causes the account deficit in the US, right? So to understand or to solve this problem, we need to understand why the US experienced a trade deficit in the first place, okay? And according to what we discussed in question three, what was one of the what were the reasons for the account deficit in the US? So we said that they were importing more than exporting. Exactly, yes. Um, so they were consuming more, yeah. So here in this case, they need to, uh, you know, export some as well. 
when they're when they're importing they need to you know produce and export goods to other countries so your solution to, to get to get it balanced exactly right so your your solution well, is if you import then you need to export the same amount to solve the problem exactly okay yeah well in theory that's how you get a zero balance of payment but in practice um it's a bit hard to do right now, um, going back to why the U.S. experiences a trade deficit, right? So in question three, we said that one of the big reasons is because foreign investors were very confident in the U.S. economy, right? So there was a high demand of foreign investment. Okay. Number three, what did we say here? So the reason why the US experiences a trade deficit was also because their trade partners had a weak currency relative to their currency, right? So USD is strong. relative to the main trade partners, okay? So according to these um, points, it looks to me that one of the reasons why the US experienced an account deficit in the first place is because there have been too much foreign investment in the country, okay? So it looks like one of the contributing factors for the US account deficit was that they had too much foreign capital, okay? Does that make sense? So because investors overseas invest too much in the US, it creates a um, capital inflow in the country. So if you have a capital inflow, um, so if you have more money from foreign countries, um, you will spend that money in goods and services, right? So as a result, when you have a capital inflow, you tend to have a um, current account deficit as well, okay? Is it, is it kind of good thing if you're having a lot of, you know, uh, currency importing from the other countries? Um, is it a good thing if you have a lot of foreign investments exactly. right yeah um so it depends on what you're talking about so if you're talking about say for example the value of your financial assets then it's a very good thing right so for example if you have a lot of demand for australian property from foreign investors then the prices of australian property will increase okay yes. <clears throat> So in this case, um, so the account deficit problem in the US is a complex problem in the sense that it's not a, um, there's no one directional relationship between these two accounts. Um, but it looks like the um, foreign investment in the US was one of the causes for why the US had an account deficit, right? So um, as we mentioned before, when you have a high foreign investment in the US economy, what happens is your US financial asset becomes very expensive, okay? So the implication of that is as more people demand your USD, it makes your USD more expensive, okay? And that actually hurts your trade deficit even more because now it's very, it's even harder for you to export, okay? Because your goods are very expensive. So, um, so the answer to this question is, um, I am not convinced that this is the right solution for the US um, trade deficit problem, right? 
because it looks to me that it is actually what causes the problem in the first place. Okay, so the more you encourage capital investment in the US, the more demand it is for the USD, and therefore the more expensive US goods and services. Okay, as a result, it hurts your exports, and it even um, it makes the trade deficit problem even worse. Okay. Okay. Um, so something to think about is how do you fix the problem, okay? So this is not part of the answer, but that's something uh, that you can think about in your free time. So how do they fix the problem? All right, so we have about seven minutes left and for the time that we have left, let me go to problem one, which is a calculation problem, okay? So for the other questions, I'll upload the solutions for you guys on the LMS. So you can have a look at um, home later on. Now, um, let's look at problem one. I want to illustrate um, how a balance of payment is, is constructed and how you can read the numbers in the balance of payment, okay? So here I've got an extract of the US balance of payments in 2000. And what I have here is number one, I've got my current account. Number two, I've got my capital or financial account. Number three, I've got my statistical discrepancy. And number four, I've got my official reserve account, okay? So what happened here is um, there is some missing information in the balance of payments and our job is to fill in these missing information, okay? So let's go from the top to the bottom. So number one, um, I want to find out what is the value of the merchandise import, okay? So how do I find this number? And what does it tell me? Okay. So basically, this is similar to an account, um, an accounting statement. Okay. So this is the statement of flow. So on the top, if you look at section two for imports in the current account, on the top you have the sum of all the subsections under section two. So this number here, this minus um. 1800 something thousand. Uh, I think it's million or billion, sorry. So this minus 1800 number is the sum of the subsections under section two, okay? So it's equal to section 2.2, 2.1, sorry, plus 2.2 plus 2.3, okay? So as a result, if I want to find the value for section 2.1, I will rearrange my equation. I will minus both sides with the values for section 2.2 and section 2.3, okay? And that will give me the value for section 2.1, which is here, okay? So if I do so, I will find that the merchandise imports is about um, 1,200 something. Okay, so it's a negative number because when I import, I need to pay. Okay, so there's a cash outflow for me. Um, second, I want to find the balance on the current account. Okay, so what is it equal to? So the balance on the current account is simply just the sum of the three sections under the current account. So sorry, I've got. Sorry, uh, yes, Danish. Uh, I, I didn't get get you for the merchandise one. How did it came one two two four point four three? It's uh, addition. Okay. So I take the sum, which is this much, right? So it's here under section right. two. Right. Right. And then I minus section two point two, and I minus section two point three. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Sorry yeah thanks. So it's okay. So um. For, for the balance on the current account, I'm going to take 
section 1, the sum of section 1, I'm going to plus the sum of section 2, and I'm going to plus the sum of section 3, okay? So to find the sum of section 1, it will be here, okay? So this is my export. Section 2 is my import, so this is the number that we look at before. Section 3 is unilateral transfer, so this is something like foreign aid or donations so on and so forth, okay? So this is 10.24. So if I add up all these numbers, um, I will find that my balance on the current account is about minus 444, okay? So I just take section 1 plus section 2 plus section 3. Oopsie, sorry. Um, in the unilateral transfer, I actually have two entries, okay? So for credits, I've got 10 point something. And for debits, I've got 64 something, okay? Okay, um, similarly for the balance on the capital account, I want to sum up the values of sections four, five, and six. So for direct investment, this is how much foreign investors invest in the US. This is how much investor invests overseas, okay? For direct investment. For portfolio investment, the net portfolio investment would be the sum of these two numbers. Okay. For other investment, similarly, if I want to find the net other investment, I will sum these two numbers up. So as a result, my balance on the capital account is going to be the sum of section four. So this is section four plus the sum of section five, which is here, plus the sum of section six, okay? For statistical discrepancies, um, to compute this number, you need to rely on the balance of payment identity, okay? So the balance of payment identity says that the sum of all of the accounts should sum up to zero, okay? Which means if you take the current account, you sum, you add the capital account, you add the official reserve account, and then you add the statistical discrepancies, everything should sum up to zero, okay? So to find a statistical discrepancy, you would rearrange the equation. And let me show you the answer here, okay? So here is your balance of payment identity. Here is what you want to find, which is your statistical discrepancy. So what you want is you want to rearrange. So you bring everything else to the right, leaving the statistical discrepancy on the left. And then you add up these numbers, okay? So we do not have enough time to go through these calculations step by step. So if you want, you can take a picture of this line. And if you're still struggling with this calculation, I'm happy to go back to this calculation next week, okay? But I think it should be okay. It shouldn't be too taxing. 
And when do you usually post the solutions uh, for this week's tutorial? Uh, normally on Friday. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks for participating today. Um, we are now two past five, so I'm gonna I'm going to have to conclude the class soon. Any last minute questions or comments? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, like about the quizzes and all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, like, when are we going to have it? Like, in in which type of format? Um. So you mean the class quizzes or the midterm tests or the Both class quizzes? Yeah, class yeah. quizzes and the midterm test. Yeah. So the weekly quizzes will be um, organized on Friday. So I'll announce the uh, week that you have the quiz on Monday, and then you have a few days to prepare, and then on Friday you're gonna have the quiz, okay? So the quiz is going to be 30 minutes, and it's going to include um, up to 15 questions, okay? So okay. Uh, multiple choice questions. Okay. And it will be for just one topic only, okay? Okay, and like it will be there on the LMS and then we can go like it, whenever <clears throat> whole day yeah, on Friday. Yeah. yeah, so the format will be similar to your revision quizzes um, okay. where you have the multiple choice questions and you click on the answer. Okay, Okay. so we just need to prepare the lecture slides for that, like go through lecture slides. That's it. It is dependent on the lecture slides you mean there. Yeah, so it will depend on the lecture slides and the tutorial questions. And the best way to prepare for these quizzes is to do the revision quiz for that week. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, because it's multiple choice. So right. you will see something similar to your revision quiz. Right, so we'll be like, is it getting started from next week or like we'll get a notification for that? Um, I will tell you which week it is. Um, and I can confirm with you that in the first three weeks, there will be no um, assessment, okay? Okay, okay. So, yeah, so from week four onwards. Okay, okay. So okay. after that, we'll be having our mid-semester exam. Mid-semester is on week six. Week six, yeah, with the same type. Uh, no, mid-semester will be uh, multiple choice and then one short answer question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we finish? It was all good, man. Thank you so much for the time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. I'm going to conclude now.